I can also welcome Sandra White, who is uh, substituting today for Stuart McMillan, uh, who has given his apologies. Uh, colleagues, can I move you to agenda item number one? Uh, and the decision is that we take agenda item number five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Colleagues, can I move you to agenda item number two, uh, which is oral evidence on the AGS report entitled The Scottish Government's Consolidated Accounts. Uh, I'd like to welcome Leslie Evans, the Permanent Secretary, uh, and Moises, the Chief Probation Officer, Alison Stafford, the Director General of Finance, uh, Barbara Allison, uh, Director for People, and Aileen Wright, the Deputy Director of Finance of the Scottish Government. Uh, I understand we have a brief opening statement from the Permanent Secretary. I became Permanent Secretary on the 1st of July this year, and as the Administration's most senior official, I am also its Principal Accountable Officer. As such, I exercise the function set out for that office by Section 14 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. And as the Act provides, I am answerable to Parliament for the exercise of my functions as Principal Accountable Officer. The Committee has before it the consolidated accounts of the Scottish Government for the financial year 2014-15, and these cover the full range of the Scottish Government activities in that year. They deal with many complex and important issues likely to be of interest to the Committee and, indeed, to the citizens and taxpayers of Scotland. Given this breadth, I have with me Alison Stafford, Director-General for Finance, Aileen Wright, who is Head of Corporate Reporting, Accountancy and Governance, Barbara Allison, Director for People, Communications and Ministerial Support in the Scottish Government, and, as requested by the Committee, Anne Moyes is here, too, in her capacity as Chief Information Officer. We will do our best uh, to answer the questions that you have posed to us today. If we can't, we will undertake to respond to you in writing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I thank you for that? Can I uh, start questions by uh, delegating the first questions to Sandra White? Hey, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. You'll excuse me if I, you know, squirm my eyes, but the light is very, very strong there. So, uh, basically, I think it's myself and Richard who are being most affected with it. I wanted to ask you first about the financial management and reporting, and you mentioned yourself, Miss Evans, about uh, the fact it's a full range of activities. Uh, but obviously, at the moment, there's no single set uh, of accounts that shows the overall position of the devolved Scottish public sector as a whole. Uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, a number of questions on that. Uh, obviously, in the absence of uh, consolidated accounts uh, for the public sector, uh, how the Scottish Government uh, will demonstrate to taxpayers that decisions in their longer term implications are sustainable? And do you have any idea if you will eventually have consolidated accounts and a time scale for that? Convener, I think our uh, work is being undertaken at the moment on how we develop from what is already a strong and sound framework for managing financial accounts for the Scottish Government. I'm keen that when doing that and in looking how we develop our financial accounting, that we take account of the fact of what these accounts are for, that we have a set of accounts here which by the um, Auditor General's own standards are sound are a good record of financial management and reporting, and that we wouldn't want to compromise those or change that record in any way, the tenth consecutive year, as you know, of us having unqualified accounts. What I do recognise is that there is an appetite, quite understandably, from Parliament and taxpayers as we increase our devolved powers and responsibilities for how our accounts link in with those of others who have a different set of accountabilities, namely local government, for example. Um, the Deputy First Minister has asked our officials uh, in the Finance Department and other parts of the Scottish Government to look at how we might develop our financial reporting, both in terms of how that takes account of future devolved uh, powers and responsibilities, but how it also connects to the other parts of the infrastructure of reporting within Scotland, so that we can get an easily navigable and accessible account of how Scotland is operating, but which takes account of the quality of our own accounts, um, the importance of the, uh, uh, not placing additional burdens on other parts who report their accounts, and also taking account of the amount of detail that is already in our own accounts, representing the agencies and others such as Transport Scotland. So we're sympathetic to the issue of how we might make a navigable 
and accessible set of accounts available to Scotland, but that would need to take account of the different component parts and the different functions that currently take place in the accounting system. Thank you. It, I, I did ask, is there a time scale for, for these improvements, as you might say? Because obviously, you know, we're looking at uh, improvements in the information uh, that comes forward so it's easily accessible for people. Is there a time scale? Uh, you mentioned the Deputy First Minister had already spoken about that. That's right. And we're undertaking work at the moment. What we would like to do in the first instance is to test some of our ideas out with um, Audit Scotland in the first instance to see what we're proposing. And Alison may wish to, Alison or Ailey may wish to come in on some of the detail of our process. But that we first of all look and see what would answer the um, legitimate question about how we get a good snapshot of how Scotland is doing without compromising some of the factors that I've mentioned earlier on and then perhaps to share that with uh, the Finance Committee or indeed this committee to see what our proposals are, would amount to and when they would come into play. So I'm, I'm happy to expand if that's, that's helpful now. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously we have already some new powers and this is the first financial year where we're seeing some devolved taxes being collected. So there's already um, an expansion of the information that will be produced at the end of this year. Obviously there's things that are in our budget but also how those are accounted for through Revenue Scotland and our own accounts. We're also um, obviously very sensitive to the fact that there's a Scotland bill going through Westminster at the moment that will be underpinned by a fiscal framework and the negotiations of that are actively taking place. Um, there was a meeting earlier, only this week, um, to continue the active engagement and the progress on that. So that's, obviously it makes sense that we have that fiscal framework in place as well. And therefore I think it's important that we use the next few months to see how that takes shape, talk to, as we've said, Audit Scotland, but also you know, the offer is there also to work with the committee as to what information you would find helpful. And also just recognising that, as you have rehearsed, the taxpayers of Scotland, and some of us will be already be getting our letters to assure ourselves that we are actually going to be taxpayers under the Scottish Rate of Income Tax from next year, that there is that information that's available. The exact format of it, I think, is something we do need to work through. Our accounts at the moment, um, based on the consolidated accounts that actually account for how the budget has been spent in year, are around 130 pages long. And it's based on a very technical format that is laid down and that we comply with under international financial reporting standards. So working out what it is that goes beyond that, that is useful and accessible, I think is part of the conversations we'd like to have. And we have some ideas that we'd be happy to talk through. Just, sorry, Jane, just one uh, final question. You mentioned the letters, obviously. I think we've all had them and you mentioned pension liabilities uh, as well. You also very kindly said that you would share information with the audit committee. Uh, would it be you know, beneficial to everyone as you go through the stages and the extra powers that the audit committee would kept up to date on what was happening with the, obviously the consolidated information or would that come through the Auditor General? Um, I actually think for something that's this and it's, it's in a new turf for the new powers that are coming in, um, there has been, as you know, with Revenue Scotland, an update process that's happened both with the Finance Committee and the Parliament's um, Audit Committee as well. So um, I would be happy to work through with the convener and the clerk the best, best method of doing that. And actually for some of the things around that we've been dealing with up to now, a workshop mode is something that actually might be quite accessible for that so that we can actually have more of a, a dialogue and we can really take on board your points. But I'm happy to use whatever mode feels best for the committee overall. Thank you. Can you brief stuff mm -hmm. entry from Mary Scanlon and then uh, Nigel Dorn. I wasn't going to come in on this, but actually I'm very disappointed at the response. We've had the same government in power for nine years. This is the government that's looking towards an independent Scotland. If there's one thing an independent Scotland needs, it's an independent Scotland balance sheet. How much is the revenue? How much is expenditure? We hear people out there talking about an eight million black hole or billion and a six billion surplus. So the, the response to Sandra White by the most senior official and the accountable officer that work is being undertaken at the moment, I actually find that quite insulting. After eight years, and all of us have been through this referendum campaign, everybody out there wants to know 
what the balance sheet is. And to say that the Auditor General is ecstatically happy about your accounts, I don't think that's the case. Uh, it's becoming increasingly important to understand the overall position of the devolved public sector. Uh, difficult for Scottish Parliament taxpayers to get a full picture. No readily accessible information about the pension liabilities. We did not Scotland report on pension uh, liabilities uh, some years ago. Surely you go around all the different sectors and add them up. So for you to come along to this committee four months before my retirement, and I'm never going to see this balance sheet, but really for you to come along and say, we're testing ideas out. Do you think that I should be content and happy with that? Because really, for the position that you hold, and I say this personally and not on behalf of any of my colleagues, I do not think it's good enough for you to respond to the Auditor General's Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts by coming along here nine years after a nationalist government and to say, work is being undertaken at the moment. It's not good enough. But I would like to ask for your response to that. I recognise the interest that is growing, and indeed, as, as in the Alison staff... Been there for years. Indeed, but of course we're in a moving picture here. We have increased our devolved powers since the 2012 Act. And as Alison mentioned, we are going to be increasing our responsibilities further as a result of when the Scotland Bill goes you through can and, make becomes changes as you go along. and becomes legislation as well. So I do recognise there is an appetite. We are in a, a moving picture. It is quite fluid. We are working and looking very carefully at what models might, uh, might suit, but we also need to take account of the complex uh, set of, of information that is already on the table here and the different accountabilities. I think consolidated accounts... I would see it being slightly different from a, a full balance sheet as well. The consolidated accounts that we will need to bring together will need to bring together the different accountabilities that operate in Scotland at the moment for devolved powers. As we know, if we're looking at it as a complete balance sheet for Scotland, that would include spend by the UK government as well and produce another dimension, an important one, but another dimension. So we need to make sure that we get whatever we produce is right. I can understand your impatience, Ms Scanlon, and that's why I was saying earlier on that the, the information that we will produce in the early part of 2016 will be tested not just with, with the uh, Audit Scotland colleagues, but of course will be brought to here and to the Finance Committee as well. And we're determined to make sure, and I was looking at a model, I think just a couple of days ago from the UK government, about how we can make this navigable and accessible to people who will be paying their taxes to the Scottish Government, as you rightly cite, in, very, in the very near future. Well, just my final point, convener, is the devolution to Scotland is being discussed in the House of Lords today and it's continuing and we're all aware of it. There will be powers being devolved to Scotland over the next decade. And if you're going to sit here for the next decade and say, oh, it's a changing feast and we're work being undertaken and we're testing ideas out, you know, that is an excuse uh, to kick into the long grass a clear outlook of the balance sheets and consolidated uh, accounts in Scotland. If that's your excuse, there will be continual devolution in other words, we're never going to see this. So I think that you could be making some form of consolidated accounts that the Auditor General is asking for and to be making changes uh, year on year as further devolution occurs. But to make the excuse that we're in a changing world, basically what you're telling us, we're not going to get uh, what the Auditor General is asking for for at least a decade. Could I, I it's a point. I'm not really in a question. I don't think I'm going to get much more here. Just, 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 on, just a brief, brief I just brief wanted answer. to be able to say that I think I've given an undertaking that we will come back shortly in the early part of 2016 with some proposals around this. We will know more as well what the Scotland Act has produced, perhaps by that time. And the undertaking is to ensure that we have accessible and easily, um, and easily navigable information for taxpayers and for the Parliament and citizens of Scotland. So I do give that commitment now. That's not to say it might not change again in the future. As you say quite rightly, further powers may still be devolved in, in the next few years. Thank you. I'm just wondering whether I could make a distinction 
from my own background, um, between financial accounting and management accounting, and recognise that all the things that you are talking about and all the things that the Auditor General sees are things that I would describe as financial accounting in the sense that they have a set of rules and theory they add up to the nearest penny. They never actually do, of course. Um, and, and these, I think, are the kind of accounts that you're talking about. And you, as I've understood it, would like a set of consolidated accounts which are the merger of those kind of accounts. Now, Activity between those, yes. Yes, yes. And, and yes. yes, indeed. Now, I think what I would be much more interested in, probably the general public would be more interested in, would be things that I'm going to describe as more like management accounts, where it's not precise, but we do actually look at the debts that are held by local authorities. Actually, we might even look at the debts that are held by Scottish companies. We might look at all sorts of other flows in and out around Scotland. They are bound to be estimates. None of this is going to come down to the nearest penny signed off by an auditor. But would there not be a value in having, this is perhaps economics rather than accounting, some general overall view, which is close to a consolidated public account, of where the debts are, the assets are, the income and the expenditure across Scotland? recognising that public sector is a part of that, a very big bit, but only a part of it. Local authorities are a significant part along with the Scottish Government. Yeah. Do you want to speak to yes. So I think, I think there's, there's merit in looking at that because um, I think the distinction you draw out between having a rules, the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards, basis for a, for a, a combined consolidation across local government, central government, and some other bodies that may be part of the Whitehall um, setup um, does mean that you end up with then very large numbers that are, have been aggregated together and a very sort of technical basis on which they've been generated. And you are then mixing up the accountabilities. And just to pick up the example that um, Ms. Scanlon raised around pensions, um, there is a really mixed arrangement that is... How it's been defined, it's not by our design, but it has been through evolution of different arrangements for supporting pension activities in Scotland. Some areas, local government for example, actually have to go out and invest the contributions that people make to be able to then sustain the pension payments as they are made. Other pensions, um, for example the health service and for teachers, then they're uh, what you might describe in a rather colloquial phrase is pay as you go. They rely on the fact that there's incomes that come into the Treasury each year that can actually then sustain the payments that go through and obviously some of the contributions that are collected are part of that. That's just to give you a for instance of the fact that there are different mechanisms here that have built up over time and using the financial accounts it pulls all that together but it actually blurs the accountabilities and those things. So I actually think that and this is where the offer is there about what are the things that people are really interested in where actually that sort of information would aid the knowledge that folks have, they understand where the taxes are going, but also where the risks and opportunities lie in relation to that. So again, that would be something I think would be able to come out in a way that um, people don't have to navigate through. I've said our accounts at the moment 130 pages. We did a consolidated one for Scotland it would probably be getting on towards double of that. That's not necessarily the most user-friendly way of people seeing data and information. So I, I support what you're saying, and I'm very happy to work with the committee on that. If I, if I might convene, could I just make the point? I would have thought that a, a useful set of accounts on that basis, that will be rounded to the nearest half billion, I suspect, would be on one side of a piece of paper. Mm. And then you'd, and you'd be able to compare it year on year over a period as to where our assets were, where our liabilities were, and what, whether or not Scotland was paying its way. And this is not a nationalist point, it's just a simple economics of Scotland PSL. Yeah. So. And you, you've mentioned the, the, the phrase economics. Um, actually, the economics um, part of the government has been producing the government expenditure and revenues for Scotland actually pretty much, pretty close, very soon after there's devolution in the first place. So that's been there, irrespective of which party has been the administration. Mm -hmm. So that has been a basis. It has um, had more of, um, it has a statistical basis rather than a financial accounting basis. So there has been some information there. But I actually think moving into the space that you describe, 
is something that can happen sooner. Um, if we're talking about specific accounts, then that actually needs a ministerial mm -hmm. um, requirements around that. It's under a ministerial drive rather than necessarily something that could happen. And also, um, it's about also the other parties that would be the providers of those in, that information actually being willing to contribute. So these are the sorts of things that would be important. Just one thing to add. Obviously, for any information we do pull together, on the basis on which it is generated, is really, really important. Um, notwithstanding what you're saying about, you know, down to the last penny. But one of the key things, and one of the things of the, the changes that we have been going through, we've been one of the first areas across the UK and Europe to actually move to international financial reporting standards. It often shocks people to know that Germany, which you might perceive as being financially advanced, are still on cash accounting. That predates me being in the government and predates my professional career as well. They're still using that methodology. So we have actually reached a point now, and the really good thing is that local government, for the first time in this current financial year that we're now in, is actually producing their information under IFRS. We actually started ours in 2007, 8? Of course, 2007, 8. So local government are now this year producing their accounts under IFRS. And just to give you a for instance on the assets, um, when the Auditor General um, referred to this distinction of basis, um, then at that point in time, if you'd have used the asset valuation of roads that are a part of the asset base of local government, that would have been a figure of five billion. On the same basis for IFRS, that would have been 55 billion. So when you get those orders of magnitude different depending on the accounting basis, you can see why we need the platforms to be the same. And for the first time this year, local government will be on the same basis as central government. So that gives us even more the right conditions for working on these things. Okay. Uh, Secretary, can I, can I raise the issue of uh, performance uh, with you in terms of providing performance information that's, that can be attached to the consolidated accounts? Is that something that's included at the moment? It isn't at the moment, um, no. although um, it's a useful signpost and we use the accounts as a signpost to other parts of the um, data and information that's available, including on performance. So, um, so what, what's the annual budget for the consolidated accounts then? Well, the budget that we're talking about at the moment in terms of um, where we would, where, where the Scottish Government account is, is £33 billion. Right, so, thir so £33 billion pounds per annum? Yes. And we can provide performance information attached to that? And we, we've taken, what, 16 years to no, provide we do. Account? We do provide performance. We provide actually something which um, the Auditor General's report highlights as being particularly successful, which is the National Performance Framework. And we're undertaking some more work on that framework at the moment. We're so you also provide interim information? Sorry? Do you, do you provide interim, so six monthly performance information? There is information, yes, yeah, the National Performance Framework is updated. This is live information on the website. Now, what and that, we is that detailed in the specific budgets? That gives you an, uh, a connection between what the money is spent on and the outcome that we're seeking to achieve. Now, where, where I think we have got more work to do, and it's work that we're doing in the government at the moment, is how we make the connections between the long-term outcomes that the National Performance Framework describes, and you'll be familiar with many of those, and what the milestones are between the spend that takes place and what the changes are that will create or produce those outcomes longer term. So we have some areas in the government which we have developed already which can give some interim milestones and which are published and made available, I'm thinking particularly in justice, but there are other areas as well, I think in housing and regeneration do this too, where they produce pieces of information which show how the milestones which will need to be exceeded and gone through to get to the longer term outcomes, how we're doing on those. But the National Performance Framework itself shows on live time and on the website whether these trends are going up or down in terms of the outcomes. And it's a really <coughs> important part of how we judge the long-term outcomes that we're investing over a number of years to achieve. Tell me which budget headings don't provide that information and why they don't. So if we can do it for justice and housing and regeneration, and there's other budgets that we don't do it for, so what's the reason for that? Well, all, all budgets are reflected in the National Performance Framework, but the specific example that I highlighted on the justice strategy is one which is we are rolling out in, the, in, uh, in our development of performance framework in the Scottish Government. 
and I've recently established a new committee within the uh, Scottish Government. Which Why will be is it taking up. so long though, to do the other ones? What we try to do is to ensure so, so just that we know could, what could the you back then. So we've got justice, we've got housing regeneration, so mm -hmm. we're doing fantastic. It was really, you know, and really moving on with that information and we're really, we're really pleased with that. That progress has been made there, is your, or your opinion. But can you give me an example of where that information has not been provided over the last cause we've had 16 years to develop that and why it's not been provided in those budget headings? The information that comes out in the National Performance Framework yeah, reflects let, let's go all back to, we can is, go back is to live and good quality information. Yeah. It is live, it is accessible, it's mm -hmm. understandable. What we're doing is trying to move into a more detailed yeah, that, milestone, that's, that's, and that's, that's recently been developed. So, so can we clarify then, let, let's put to the side the National Framework at the moment. Well, let's look at the milestones that we're referring to, mm -hmm. which you have advised us that you're happy with the progress that's been made in justice and in housing regeneration. Can you give me an example of two budget headings where we don't provide that information? No, because we provide information on how our performance is going across the piece to Parliament on a regular basis. What we have done within the justice set of, uh, of initiatives is to pull the whole justice uh, system together, so those bits that we're responsible for and those which are further away from government, and look at what the collective impact is on making that outcome a reality. And that's what has been innovative in the way that we have developed. That's relatively new. Uh, it's been very well received, not just by uh, people who use a justice system, but further so can, afield. Can, can, I, can I put it another way then? I've got education and I have justice. So in justice, you've advised me that we have milestones there, there's information is provided, on an interim basis every six months? It's, re it's published yeah. regularly on the, yeah, on the, on the, the National so Performance that you're Framework. Really, and we're happy with the progress that's been made in that area. So let's look at education and compare it with education. Does education provide the exact same information? As it does provide information, yes. It provides comparable information. The difference is that what the justice uh, strategy has brought to bear is to look at what the inputs are, without getting too technical, that would allow us to achieve those outcomes and track those. And that's done in a, a whole system approach. And we are doing that and looking at that okay. across the piece, so, which is why I've established, if, if I could just finish yeah. this point, it's why I've established um, specifically a fresh approach to our performance framework when I took up post and have asked Alison to head up how we roll out that more detailed yeah, yeah, information. Yeah. But we are still reporting regularly through well, no, a no, range but, but, of sources to Parliament let, let, let me just and finally, on the website yeah. on so how let, our performance. Let, let me just finally put it another way then. You have a five star approach to the, to the information that you've provided in respect of justice and housing and regeneration. Of what you're advising us is it could be three star for the other elements. That, you know, no, I'm, I'm not saying that, Convener. What I'm saying is we have a five star uh, national performance framework, which has been endorsed as such by the Auditor General's report. That is seen as innovative. In fact, other countries come to us regularly to find out how we go about so producing that information. That? We've had inf we've had people visits from across Europe. So, um, so any specific ones? In I can give you some dates and times of those. I can write to you with the specifics. And have they have said that they think that the system that you've got? They are they are interested because I think Scotland is unusual, if not un unique, in producing this system, which you'll be familiar with, which is working towards outcomes. In other words, the outcome that we seek to achieve will require a number of different portfolios and a number of different systems to make the change that we seek to make for the people of Scotland and to improve life for the people of Scotland. Okay. Within that, there is a very... Uh, well-trodden and well-embedded machinery to show how we are working towards those outcomes. And that is supplemented by reports to Parliament, by published reports, and by, by committees and, and pieces of scrutiny by the Auditor General and others. What we have changed in terms of the justice strategy example that I've given you is that we have used um, across a whole system uh, an innovative approach to try and get underneath the skin of why those causes and effects are making a difference in some parts and not in other parts of the justice system. Okay, we've got a supplementary from Richard Simpson. Yes, I mean, we're, we're really talking about paragraphs 44 and 45 of the Auditor General's report. And the end of that, it said um, that, that there is scope to set out clearer plans for how outputs and outcomes will be improved in budget documents. Such an approach would help strengthen the parliamentary oversight of government spending. Now, so, you know, I hear what you're saying, that we're ahead of the rest and we're, we're making progress and it is a work in progress. And I understand that. 
you know, we've been in progress, as Mary Scanlon said, since I sat in the Finance Committee back in 1999 and looked at the Oregon state budgets, which were very full. And I, I were, you know, we wanted that as a model here. If, if you take health, for example, which is my particular interest, as you'll know, uh, uh, Ms. Evans, we are almost entirely focused on targets, which are process targets. These are inputs, not outputs, and they are not outcomes. And you know, whilst these targets were undoubtedly vital and in, in, in driving up the, the performance in relation to what the patients received in, and how quickly they got, or sorry, not what they received, but how quickly they had access to the service, and that's been very valuable. But in terms of outcomes, we know nothing about it. So you know, when the convener asks you about outcomes related to budget and health. I have no sight of that hardly at all. Hardly at all. The only, the only field in which we've got outcomes which show that there's been progress is really cardiovascular disease, and that's probably nothing to do with what we're spending in health. It's everything to do with what's going on in the community because it's happening across the world no matter what's happening. So, you know, I wonder if you couldn't give this committee, and it won't be when I'm here either. I'm like Mary Scanlon. I'm retired, but it'd be nice to think as our legacy, that we managed to get you to produce a report indicating what you're going to do over the next few years, starting with a report you're going to give us in the spring of, of the development. But tell us in health how you're going to actually change the system so that we move from a system of targets to one of budgets related to outcomes. And what I would say in that response, and I understand entirely, health is a very good example of the need for outcomes because of the complexity of what contributes to the health of a community and an individual, and you will know that better than most. And targets serve a purpose, but in themselves, they will not produce an outcome. Absolutely agree. Where I am interested in trying to make the connection between the finances and the financial accounting and indeed some of the management accounting that was referred to earlier on is to make the connection between the documentation that we have at the moment so that it makes sense on the cause and effect. Now, what, why I was emphasising the importance of the National Performance Framework in response to the, to the convener's question here is because that still remains to us the most important element of how we track long-term changes and the indicators within them give us a really clear understanding of what is making a difference to those outcomes. What we need to, to connect that to is the information which is still evolving and which I've given an undertaking to Ms. Scan and I will be coming back to in the early part of 2016 with proposals about how the consolidated or our version of consolidated accounts can relate most clearly to that national performance framework. Now, I'm absolutely clear because you know, I go out and speak to people and they talk to me, believe you me, they talk to me about the importance that they see about what they want to know of what government is doing, how it is accountable, what a difference it's making to their own communities, what a difference it's making to their own services that they're taking. So I don't underestimate the importance of us being accessible and a more open government and giving um, uh, undertakings to produce a way in which the accounts, which were of particular purpose, predominantly financial, relate to performance information and how we can make those two connect and the connectivities between them improved. But it will not change the fact that the National Performance Framework will still remain our gold standard of tracking to outcomes because that is why we, that is the decision that was taken a long time ago and one which I think is now embodied in the Community Empowerment Act. Incidentally, there is an opportunity when we look again at the, at the first part of, of implementing the Community Empowerment Act about what information ministers want to publish and how they publish that. So this aligns quite neat, neatly with that, though that will be later on in the year. But that doesn't stop us, and it just certainly doesn't stop me and Alison in her role, as I've just appointed her, to look at performance about where these two things connect to make a navigable and accessible statement of cause and effect to outcomes and tracking the milestones of progress between now and when we reach those. I mean, I do realise, Kavina, and then I'll stop. I do realise some of the outcomes we're talking about are, you know, not short term. They're, some They're of them not. are very long term. I mean, there are things in health which we've set up, which we have all agreed is a good thing. We know the outcomes won't occur for 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. But being able to get, you know, an idea of the milestones Indeed. along the way you know, and how they're met, and if they're not met, as they weren't on climate change, for example, yes. how relevant is that? You know, yes. if we're, how far off track are we, you know, in terms of our budget in that field? 
uh, you know, sh does it mean we should be applying more money? So the Finance Committee can say when they look at the budget, yes, the Audit Committee has done its job, which it can't do at the moment, uh, uh, and saying these outcomes are way off target and it's serious or it's not serious. And so we can advise them to do, so they can do their job. Could I make one more point, convener, in response to that? You're absolutely right. Many of these outcomes, most of them are long-term, many of them are very long-term. They're also very deep-rooted problems, and they're not solved by one portfolio or one budget line. That is very clear. And that's why we're in new territory. The other issue which, has, which we have had to put in place to get the national performance framework um, operational and live is to ensure that we can actually collect the kind of information which will inform those outcomes. So sometimes we have had to put in, in a couple of instances I can think of, baselines and to collect that baseline data to know whether it's improving or not. That's the first point. And the second point is often the indicators that would allow us to know whether that outcome is getting near or not are also quite complicated. So, for example, I can think of dental health of children, which in itself gives you a snapshot of how a child's mouth looks. But we know also from research and statistical analysis that it can give you some information about the wider state of care that that child's receiving, about issues around poverty and vulnerable children. So we're ambitious for the National Performance Framework, and unapologetically so. We're clear that it does require us to have milestones and indicators, live information. Some of those indicators have to be created. Some of that baseline data has to be gathered. Um, but I do understand and I do appreciate that in doing that, we have to also start to develop the connectivity with the finance accounts, not change the accounts other than what we've talked about in terms of consolidated options, but see how they relate to each other for the people of Scotland, but also for Parliament. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Secretary, over the past few years, we've uh, looked at quite a number of ICT contracts, uh, most of which have not gone particularly according to plan. And there does appear to be certain common factors within that. Uh, perhaps uh, the most recent uh, NHS 24 issue uh, is a good example. And here we have a situation where there are basic flaws in the contracts. Uh, I mean, you don't need to be a lawyer to read that contract and uh, realize that uh, it's not fit for purpose. The scoping of the project is inadequate. There's an over-reliance on vendor input, presumably reflecting the fact that uh, the in-house skills are not there to be able to uh, address that. And there are management issues around that. Now, looking at this going forward, I mean, obviously we are where we are in the projects that have taken place. Going forward, how are we going to address those simple basic errors that are costing us so much money? Um, Anne Moises might want to say something specifically about NHS 24 and the work that's being done to review uh, that project. Side rather than Abs absolutely. I'm no. using that as an example. I am, absolutely understand that. And we have been cognizant and have heard uh, very clearly the messages that have come through Audit Scotland on this. We've had two reports on the nature of our ITC projects and uh, it's an area that we have taken a lot of time and a lot of work over recently to try and change the way that we operate and can give a little bit more detail on that. But the two areas that I would pick out, three actually that I think have been most important to, uh, to improve and to uh, reflect on the experience of some of our IT pro projects. Incidentally, there are some that have gone quite well and I would happily give you some examples of that, but I know that's not what you're wanting to hear about this morning. First of all, is to look at the way that we construct and lead the teams that help us and support those senior responsible officers who are leading on complex IT transformation uh, schemes. And that is to do with uh, the ICT assurance framework that's been put in place and also the digital transformation service. And Anne can talk a little bit more detail about what those mean. But basically, they're a resource for senior responsible officers about what they need to know and how they need to get ready for projects, the kinds of assurances that they need to have. So they're a source of advice and information and expertise. The second thing we have done is to develop our own talent work stream, and you mentioned yourself about skills. We're in an incredibly competitive market here in trying to attract people who can command very significant salaries uh, in this area. It's a growing field, you will know this yourself. Uh, but we have been successful in um, 
in attracting talent into our own team. And I think we've just recruited another 19 posts of people who will be joining our team, some of whom I believe have taken pay cuts to come and work for the Scottish Government on this, uh, partic on this particular stream of work. And we're going to be using them as part of our resource for the senior responsible officer advice and assurance that, that we're seeking and uh, the support that we're giving them. The other issue is the wider issue to do with skills gaps and skills shortages across the piece, and we can talk a little bit more about that later on. But I don't know if Anne wants to say something about the generic issues that we're pursuing just now. And I can give you some examples of the successful projects, which I would hate to feel haven't been recorded in some way this morning. Um, I would absolutely acknowledge that projects fail for the same reasons over and over again. Um, it's uh, something that happens not just within government, it happens across the industry as a whole. Um, and what we are doing is we are working very hard to try and help projects at the initiation stage to ensure that they have the right skills, the right resources available so that the projects and programmes get off to the best possible start. And by using the assurance framework, which we've also introduced, to very clearly signpost the common causes of system and project failure and to actually get the project team, the SRO and the accountable officer to look at these right at the very start and to start tackling the causes of failure all the way through the projects and programmes. Now, some of the work we have done um, has been within the last two years or so. We updated the ICT assurance framework earlier this year some of the large projects that have hit the headlines recently started quite a time before these new measures were introduced. But the, um, the way that we will know that we are actually making a difference is when we get the, the SROs, the accountable officers and the project leaders to engage with us at the very early stages and to actually say, we've gone through your checklist, we recognise that we have got potentially problems here, here and here, how can you help? And at that point, we will work with the Office of the CIO and the new Digital Transformation Service to try and embed skills that will not necessarily take them all the way through the projects, but will help them find the right resources, access the right skills. Um, the Digital Transformation Service, for example, is working with about five different central government organisations at the moment, purely to help them resource and bring in the skills that they have now recognised they need to take forward the programmes that they have underway. I'll come back to skills in a second, because that's a very important aspect. But what you're talking about here is trying to address a uh, shortage of IT skills and so on. Mm. Coming back to the very basic part, the contract, I mean, that has nothing to do with IT skills. Firstly, it's sensible management, being able to read a contract and understand yes, where there's gaps. And secondly, who do we use as lawyers? In, previous, in my previous life, when we had uh, I, IT contracts, you spent a very, very great deal of money on lawyers to get every single line right, mm -hmm. apart from having the expertise yourself to be able to look at a contract and realise if it's sensible. Why isn't that happening? This is not the first time. On the, the, just as clear as possible okay. just to, to, to on, the, on the specific contract areas it, it um, it's a slightly it depends which organization we're talking about some organizations have in-house legal capacity such as Scottish government others go legal capacity if they're not able to do a contract properly they, they, there are legal colleagues within various organizations but in some cases um, in some of the ones I've been directly involved with we've actually gone out and we've hired. Um, independent legal counsel for people who are very practised in this particular area. So, for example, the Swan contract, we had external legal advice, uh, which was assured by our own internal legal people. So it, it, it is possible to do this right. Um, contract management, which is a, 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 a la latter issue, it is something else that we are actually working quite, um, quite hard with procurement colleagues to increase and upskill, but I take the point that you're actually talking at the point at which the contract is late or, or before you sign on the dotted line, ensuring that it is viable um, and puts the buying organisation in a strong position. Yes. Clearly that did not happen 
specifically in the NHS 24 yes. side, but also in previous contracts we've looked at as well. And frankly, IT is this highly specialised area. These contracts are highly specialised contracts. Would it not be normal to assume that it would be rare for an organisation such as this to have the internal expertise for this? And wouldn't you normally contract this out to expert lawyers that would ensure that we don't end up with cost overruns arising from the fact that we, we didn't get the contract right? In some large and complex cases, yes, independent external lawyers would be used. In others, um, for example, some of the ones I've been involved in recently, we have used Scottish procurement colleagues who have a lot of experience in contract letting um, and who do a very good job consistently. We go outside for NHS 24. It's, I, it was a big contract. What, how do you define a big contract? Anything over five million, probably. We, we would look very hard at what was happening. Those are the ones that are gate we reviewed. Um, some below that particular financial sign-off um, are complex in that the components of them are novel or innovative. And something that was novel and innovative, again, you would probably want to get expert advice on. So some of the stuff that we will probably be doing in the future around cloud contracts, for example, is an area we would absolutely seek expert advice. Um, on the particular NHS 24, I'm afraid I can't actually comment on why they didn't seek external um, legal advice, um, but more than happy because I know that the colleagues are reporting to you anyway on making sure that that particular issue is handled. Can, can I just touch briefly on the skill shortage, which we've already discussed? There is a, a generic skill shortage across the whole market worldwide, and that, as I saw recently uh, in reports, has been exacerbated by the uh, companies and governments hiring people because of the cyber attacks that uh, they've been experiencing, and they're yeah. sucking up any excess uh, skills in the market. How are you going to compete against that? And how are we protecting ourselves in terms of when we're constructing these contract uh, these uh, projects? How are we protect protecting ourselves against cyber attacks? I'll ask Anne to talk a bit about the work that we've got in hand on cyber attacks. In terms of the skills process, obviously we have a responsibility not just to grow our own talent, but to look more widely across Scotland. My understanding is the figure that's being cited at the moment in terms of the skills gap here is about 11,000 jobs. So we're working with uh, Skills Development Scotland um, who are looking uh, at how they can develop and encourage more take-up of digital learning opportunities, not just in uh, graduate but also in uh, undergraduate and in school terms and working closely with Education Scotland on that too. And the other area which has recently uh, come onto the scene is the Academy Code Clan, which is where we've got around 34 students now in a new uh, digital-focused um, academy specifically looking at digital skills and that's the first I think two years of the intake on on that uh, um, academy so we are we are aware of the fact that we have a responsibility more widely to be able to develop the um, skills for Scotland as well as developing the talent in the way that I've described uh, in attracting our own and developing our own teams but can I just make one generic point about the, the, the generic question that you asked about ICT I mean, they are incredibly challenging, these projects. They're incredibly challenging, and usually government is wrestling with some of the most complex um, and biggest contracts in a very public way and being held accountable quite rightly to the public for how we spend the, the public purse on these big, complex, uh, trans often transformational projects. Um, we will be reporting back in the spring on our response to how we have implemented the recommendations that the Auditor General asked us in her two previous reports to consider. And so Anne will be leading the team in, in coming back to me on, and probably to you on how we have fulfilled that. And some of the questions that you have asked will be part of that account. Um, the Scottish Government Audit and Risk Committee... I have asked them to bring the, uh, I, the issue of IT towards them as well and to come and, and have a discussion with them about what we're doing and what our efforts are here and where the areas are where we're particularly vulnerable and particularly um, open to, to uh, difficulties and risks. Uh, it's on our risk register as well, on a regular basis. And the third point is that I have said that I will report to ministers on how we're doing and developing on our ICT um, uh, responsibilities and the projects, both small that Anne describes and the bigger ones. And you know, at some point we'll probably talk about uh, CAP as well, which is another example of not just ICT but also other big changes 
in the way that we deliver funding to an important uh, community in Scotland. Okay. Just a, a brief question before I bring in Richard Simpson. Can I take us back to the NHS 24 contract? And can I just ask Permanent Secretary if, if I was asking you to sign a contract for £75 million, pounds, I'm sure you would read through the entire document, would you not? I would want to be aware that the, comp that the document was fit for purpose and so I want not assurance sh on that. But you would, you would want the document to have been read through, though, would you not? I'd want the, the assurance that the document was fit for purpose, absolutely. Yeah, but I'm asking you the question, though. Would you expect it to have been read through? The I would whole have document to have been Would you have expected the whole document to be inspected? Is that doc I mean, it's a contract for £75 million. Pounds. I would expect somebody to be responsible for ensuring that that document was right, fit for purpose and appropriate. Yeah, so in the example of NHS 24 and the evidence we received last week, the document wasn't read through. Now, no matter what measures that we take, uh, you know, whatever we talk about, what we've learned from this experience, surely as a basic, we would expect contracts at that level of that expenditure to have been read through. Would that not be a... I mean, you're, you're a permanent sector, you're responsible for... You have so many responsibilities, I understand. You would expect those kind of contracts to be read through, wouldn't you? I would so expect basic. the team in charge absolutely to be clear about what they were signing up to and that the document was fit for purpose. I agree. And that is why I know that there is a report being undertaken at the moment into what went wrong in that preparation, including some of the information that you have already ha had shared with you and will be coming back to the Cabinet Secretary for Health in the very near future. And is there a possibility that similar experiences have happened with other contracts that haven't been read through and have been signed for £75 million? Pounds? I think Anne has given you an account of how we're trying to ensure that every um, opportunity for people to be trained, to be developed and to be aware of their responsibilities before signing any contract. But the but person who would sign the contract, as was confirmed last week, was the accountable officer, is that correct? It would be the accountable officer in NH24, yes. Yeah. So it's a basic responsibility of an accountable officer uh, to at least ensure that the document has been read through and the auditor tells us here it's not been read through. It is the responsibility of the accountable officer to, uh, to assure themselves that that document is fit for purpose, is correct and is appropriate for the contract that's being sought. So if there are any other contracts where we can uncover that there hasn't been a basic read-through of a document, then you would be disappointed with the accountable officer then, wouldn't you? I would be disappointed if accountable officers were not assuring themselves of the fit for purpose nature of their contracts that they were letting. And Absolutely. anyone who found themselves in that position wouldn't be fit to be an accountable officer anywhere else or any other contract firm. I mean, it's a very basic responsibility. Is it it's not? a very important responsibility for, a private, for a, um, an accountable officer, I agree, in letting any contracts. But the measures that have been put in place would ensure that this never happens again. We don't expect this ever to come back to the committee. I can never say that I will never come back to the committee and we will never have a, uh, a disappointing or a, a risky uh, ICT contract. I would be a very foolish yeah, yeah, principal that, accountable that's fair, officer. But that, that, that's but absolutely I, fair. But, but, but I think... The basic issue of reading a document, I've seen loan agreements for much less than 75 million, and it says at the bottom of it, please read carefully, because you're taking on a significant responsibility as a result of you signing this document. If I'm an accountable officer and I sign a document that says I am responsible for 75 million pounds, the basic please read carefully should at least be in that document. Now, all I'm asking you is, well, we ensure that there's something basic that says, please ensure as an accountable officer, when you're signing for signs sign of significant uh, responsibility, that you please read carefully, should be the very basic, should it not? And therefore, therefore we won't have anyone back at this committee. I, I would be surprised if that's not in the advice that Anne Moyes is giving to her accountable, the accountable officers and the senior should have been there before. But however, you've made that point very clearly, and we would... We but should it have been there before, though? I mean, somebody should have been advised, please read carefully, it says £75 million pounds here, please read it. Uh, you know, it's a lot of money. Uh, absolutely, of money. I'm not demurring from that. And yeah. the common sense, apart from anything else, would give you the... Yeah. Uh, would emphasise the importance of and reading a document that one signs. And finally, you could ask them if it, was a, if it was a private company, they could have been bankrupt, is that not correct? So we've got public money here, so we keep providing public money to prop up these situations. That's unacceptable, is it not? What is unacceptable is that we don't do anything in, in the light of what we're learning and in the light of what we know is going wrong. 
and that's why I'm here today. Uh, and Anne, I know, was invited particularly to talk about this because I know it's an area of concern. It will continue to be a challenging area for government for some of the reasons that we have raised, not just to do with skills, but because of the complexity yeah. of the number. There's, there's no but excuse. I am not demurring from the responsibility yeah. of accountable officers yeah. to ensure that we get fundamentals right. Yeah. There are actually three separate issues. There's the one NHS 24 where the tender document was not transcribed to the contract. And it seems to me as the government, and Ms Moyes, as the government officer involved in this, I cannot believe that these were not cross-checked by somebody in government. Because the individual agencies don't have the skills to know if things are actually right or not. They, they, they know about their own area of work, but they don't know about the technical aspect. So the fact the government is not cross-checking a tender document against a contract seems to me utterly astonishing, and it's cost us millions, tens of millions of pounds. But, I mean, I assume that the conveners really dealt with that. The second area is uh, when, the, the, when the procurement process actually doesn't produce the result in terms of the, uh, if I may call it, the clinical output. So if we take in health the e-care program, which uh, cost us 56 million and was going to solve all our problems about a common assessment and a common recording process across social care and health care, and 56 million pounds later, we abandoned it completely. Uh, and, and we still don't have a, we did still don't have a system in place. We've got all sorts of small systems in place, but not a common system. Now that's one where, you know, the, the, out, the outcomes that we wanted in terms of how this, what this would do for us just didn't occur. So the procurement process was wrong. So I'd like to know what your comment on that is. And then the other one is, uh, the, the, there are two others. One is that when we develop, we've gone for not having a centralized system in health. And I'm glad we did that because we avoided the problems they've had in the UK where the, the expenditure and the massive uh, health program of 12 billion pounds, much of which was wasted. So they there was massive waste. But if we take the health service, we've got a situation because we've chosen to allow these individual boards who have no expertise or little expertise or certainly grossly insufficient expertise to develop their own systems. We have a system in Scotland at the moment where a patient in Inverness's records cannot be read by an, an expert in, 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 in Glasgow, even though their treatment is there. There is no interconnectivity between all the boards in Scotland in terms of their portal system. If I'm a doctor sitting in Edinburgh and, and I have someone visiting me who's registered with a patient in Inverness, they can't even go on and look at laboratory results because the Sky program isn't connected. Now, these are programs that were set up eight, nine years ago and are still not interconnected. And the health committee was promised in 2011 that this would be sorted and it's not sorted. So there's a question of the safety by having devolved systems, which we seem to have gone for, is great in terms of the cost side because these portal systems all individually work, but they're not connected up. So the system does not deliver for the individual clinician. And I can tell you there are clinicians sitting today who are going in and out of individual portals that are reported to me as being connected, and it takes them six or seven minutes to switch out of one and into the other. And when you've only got 20 minutes to see a patient, seven minutes to switch portals to get their information up is totally unacceptable. So I am angry about that. And then the final one is the fact, the last one is the, is the procurement of off-the-shelf programs. And that is something which is entirely appropriate. It, it, these are often highly tested systems. There may be in other jurisdictions with other systems. But when you get a system like tra the track care contract, where for nearly 24 hours in Glasgow, which was the lead authority, uh, bought track care first, the system goes down for a routine maintenance. If I was a bank, I'd be been fined by the fiscal authorities millions of pounds for what they did to my customers. But oh no, in health, We've got the system which is fundamental to the management of patients allowed to go down because of procurement for routine, for an upgrade, it goes down. There's no continuity. There's no double running that allows the system to continue for the clinicians while it's being upgraded on a second set of servers uh, to be maintained. So those are the three instances I would like replies to. If I can take the procurement expertise in the first instance, um, and I'm not sure that we will have enough detailed information to be able to answer your very detailed questions, which are entirely legitimate, I might add. 
uh, on the uh, approach to ICT in health, and if not, then I will undertake, undertake personally to respond to you on those. But in terms of the procurement, we recognised some time ago the absolute fundamental importance of having an expertise in procurement and, a grow and growing expertise in commerciality as well, something which government has struggled with in the past um, and something which we're still working on now. But we now do have a director of procurement and commercial um, who sits on the information system uh, board, so advises Anne and the projects that we're talking about, particularly the smaller ones, which are less likely to have access to this kind of information. And he and his team are immersed in commercial knowledge and in information. Now, that is a growing expertise. It's not complete, but it's been very important to us as we've looked increasingly at either buying kits off the shelf or indeed looking at the specification. And the specification is the thing that actually will make or break whether the procurement works or not, as well as the legions of um, uh, uh, regulations and legislation around what we can and can't do in good procurement, including, of course, going to the European market and so on. So we have uh, not a finished product, but a very good uh, director of procurement uh, and commercial information and a good team within there who are supporting us improving our approach to how we grow ICT capacity and our preparedness for the kind of contracts that you've mentioned. As far as health is concerned, I mean, I understand entirely the um, unacceptability of having, the benefit of having small local, but the unacceptability of those talking to each other. And it's not just in health where we have found some instances of that, though I appreciate that is where it, it impacts most on the customer service and on patients, of course. What I would undertake to do is write to you on where we are with that and our intentions, um, particularly the point that you make about um, the, off -the, shelf, the inadequacy of the off-the-shelf project that you referred to, but also what our plans are to ensure that we can get better connectivity. It's not just in health, and it is a history and one that I've had experience in a previous role of where systems don't speak to each other. So the question is, do you buy a system that completely blankets all of those smalls? As, as they have done in other parts of the, of the United Kingdom? Or do you try and get some connectivity between those systems and how costly is that? And often the systems are quite old. So the difficulty is that you're actually replacing and spending a lot of money on a connectivity which actually will become outdated because digital process and skills and uh, development are so rapid. So I absolutely understand your frustration and not least the biggest issue here is not just what happens with the contracts, but their impact on the public and people who expect services to answer their needs. So I will undertake to write to you on that if that's acceptable. Thank you. Question from Nigel Dawn and then a brief one from Colin. Thank, thank you very much, Convener. You very conveniently, Ms. Evans, got to the, to the point that I wanted to ask you about, actually, because we've already agreed that the things you're dealing with are extremely complicated. Many of the things that you're now working with are old. And therefore, they reach a sort of point where you think you need to be replacing them anyway. If I'm right in believing that every program, every every yes, every program, every system that you're putting in now has a lifespan, and there is a risk that those lifespans are getting shorter simply because things are getting overtaken, then surely there is an even bigger problem in terms of skills and management, because actually, what you're trying to do now is less than you will need to do in the future just to maintain what you've currently got, never mind to develop the new systems that you might want in other areas where you aren't currently even, even automated, if I can use that phrase. Has anybody given any thought to the actual skills management um, and indeed the whole management of that project in the longer term as it gets more complicated and there are more systems out there? Please. Indeed. In fact, I would say we're looking very carefully. I'm leading a piece of work at the moment, as I, as I instigated when I came in, at looking at what we need in the way of skills management and capability over the next five years in Scottish Government, not just in the important area of ICT, which I think is the area that you're focusing in on. So this isn't unique to that. We need to think about whether we've got the civil service, the structure and the governance approaches to enable us uh, to, to cope with the knowns and the unknowns of the next five years. But Anne might like to talk a bit about what we've got in place already to try and, as you say, future-proof some of our skills yeah. um, challenges. If I might interrupt, but I would be interested to hear, can I suggest that even five years might not be long enough? Hopefully Indeed. you're talking about programmes that are there for 10 or 15 Absolutely. rather than five. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm talking about five years in terms of five years of the government as opposed to a longer-term horizon scanning process. You're quite yeah. right. Okay. If I could possibly pick up sort of two points related to your question. One about the 
kind of built-in obsolescence of some software as you buy just now. Well, one of the things that we are looking at very closely in procurement is actually when you buy something new, you plan for its replacement almost immediately. So it's not just about the contract to deliver what you've got, it's how you get out of that contract at the end, mm -hmm. how you ensure that the data and the, um, the knowledge that has gone into that system can be properly transferred into something new, assuming that's what's going to happen. So there's a procurement and um, contract element around that that we are tackling. On the skills and the talent we are going to need in the future, um, the um, skills analysis work that we did across Scotland looked not just at the current skills gaps, in other words, what do we need now, it, it asked organisations what they thought their, their future skills requirements would be. And the work that we're doing in the skills investment plan and with Code Clan are attempting to tackle some of those things. So um, the one that was consistent, which is a gap now and will be as perceived as being a gap in the future is around cyber. Um, where people are very, very conscious of the dangers um, of cyber attack and, and security. So the work we are doing around cyber is will take some time to come through. So it's working with colleges, it's working with industry to create um, courses, it's to create um, transferable skills. So people who perhaps work in the industry at the moment but are in an area which is downsizing or not being required can reskill in the areas that are up and coming and that we absolutely know we're going to need more of in the future. Okay. Could I make one other suggestion? Just another comment. I hesitate to, to mention um, the common agricultural payments, um, particularly at this stage. In <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I yeah. thought that might come up, yes. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to mention that the IT uh, system which is designed for that, which is only one element, of course, of, of the challenge, has been designed specifically to last longer than the programme, more than seven years. So we're already thinking about what might need to replace that on and the basis that you're talking about. A brief supplementary from Colin Keir. Good morning. Good morning. Um, partially answered uh, what I was about to ask, but um, one of the things I've noticed in quite a lot of the, or what seems to have been apparent in many of the procurement processes as we've gone through um, reports over the past number of months is when it comes to the contract and taking it forward and seeing what the outcomes are, there's been some doubt in my mind on and some of them that there's been a bit of a clarity of purpose or where do you want to be with this and you you have the initial contract perhaps even the tender and then you get to the situation where you think ah that's not perhaps uh, what we wanted and there's been changes within the contract how clear are we that the management at the initial stages and the advice that's given to uh, those who are uh, managing and giving advice about these uh, contracts are clear in their own mind as to what the purpose of the contract actually is. That's a good point and I, I know Anne will share with you some of the work that's being done by the teams that we mentioned uh, with the senior responsible officers and the accountable officers. I think the only thing I would say is it goes back to the point I was making earlier on that the specification of what is required is crucial and a very crucial part of the very early stages of procurement. Sometimes that changes that's the other issue, and actually we will come on to, uh, to CAP, but that was an example there where we were working very hard on getting the IT for CAP and what we thought was being known to be required for CAP right, but actually it changed, it changed quite significantly, and it changed as a result of both what the industry wanted, but more particularly what EU uh, decided they wanted to specify and some of the changes around their regulations. So being able to, pro to um, specify something which is flexible enough to allow some of those customer focused or other kinds of changes is a real challenge. And that's part of getting the specification right in the first instance. I don't know, Anne, if you want to say anything about what, is, what we're doing at the moment to, to, to train and support people in that role. Um, the specification is the key to everything because the specification leads to the contract. Um, if you know exactly what it is you want to procure, um, and you, can go, you know you're going to need exactly the same thing for the next three years, you can go out and buy it. Um, very seldom does life stay still for that length of time, particularly around ICT programmes and projects. So part of the um, 
change in approach to how we actually do some of this is to be more agile, which is to recognise that change will be constant. So to set up contracts which um, do have a degree of flexibility and you go into assuming that there will be change, but crucially that the change to the contract is effectively managed and that the, the government organisation who wishes the change and the supplier who's delivering that change are really clear about exactly what's involved, the degree of flexibility. Um, the worst kind of contract is one where every three weeks you're attempting to change it. It, it, it adds cost, it adds complexity. So it's, it's getting the balance right between agility, flexibility and some degree of certainty around the costs. Um, from a buying perspective, if I can absolutely specify what I need, I can negotiate the suppliers down, I can get a fixed cost, I can hold them to that. If I don't know what I need, I do have to be considerably more flexible. Um, but the key then is managing change effectively. Can I just oh, very quickly, uh, thank you, convener. Assuming that that's the case, obviously every time there's a change, there's a financial consequence, and we have had a, a fair history um, of seeing, particularly IT contracts the costing is going really through the roof. Now, even allowing for what you've said uh, there, is, is the understanding of how, how, how can we drag these costs down? How can we actually manage them? How can we recognise them, and particularly through the audit function, uh, let alone the actual management of it? It, it kind of... Without going into the... Yeah, I'd the, want to go into the, 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 the... The practical difficulties of a a contract which could have uh, clauses in it which reduce the amount of information that could come out, shall we say. Yeah. But we really need to know how can we how can we keep a hold of this within the audit function that we're obviously dealing with. Yeah. Um, one thing is at the very start of your programme or project to recognise that there are likely to be changes to have set up the contract in such a way that you and the supplier are very clear how that the work to deliver those changes will be costed and on what basis and throughout the life of the contract is that going to be a consistent basis so uh, things like um, increased cost of living all those sorts of things if get that if you get that nailed at the start you're going to have much it doesn't mean change won't happen but you'll have a much higher degree of certainty about how you can manage and control the costs of those changes um, the other thing is specifying the changes really in a degree of detail um, and negotiating with the supplier about exactly how you're going to deliver those and challenging the supplier. Same as Thank you. Um, can I just ask a couple of brief questions before coming to my uh, substantive question on CAP? Uh, the first one, convener, is to Anne Moises. And you did, uh, I think, say that the digital transformation service, the government's source of advice and expertise, you're working with five organisations at the moment. Can you tell us which five organisations you're working with? Uh, yep, if you hold on just a second. They are actually about to start working with the the Futures Programme, um, who are suffering uh, some losses on their teams at the moment, so that's one of them. Um, they are working with National Records of Scotland on recruitment. They are working with Scottish Courts, Scottish Enterprise and the Care Inspectorate. Okay. So they're not working with NHS 24 or the CAP Futures Programme? They are working with the CAP Futures Programme on potential recruitment for particular... Well, you businesses. said five organisations, so you've listed five, so there's more than five. Oh, there's more than five. CAP, CAP, right. CAP was yesterday. Your response was uh, to yes. Richard Simpson was five. Uh, and my second question, can you tell me if the uh, CAP payments in uh, Northern Ireland, England and Wales uh, are facing the same problems as in Scotland, or are they being paid out uh, at the due time? Um, you'll be aware the deadline for payments is June, and my understanding is that all the countries in the UK will be subscribing to that deadline. Um, but on the specifics of your point, um, Wales and Northern Ireland are counting their region as one region, so that is different to the way that we're operating. 
we're operating under our CAPS program um, uh, a, a description which gives us three regions, three payment regions and three livestock schemes. That was in response to requests from the industry themselves that we configure it in that way. I was way. only asking if they're paying it on time and if they're having problems with expenditure in IT, that's all. My understanding is that they are paying it uh, in two parts, like we are in Wales, but in one part in, uh, with the DEFRA English, uh, and they are still intending to get theirs out before the June payments in the same way that we are. So they, they are, are paying deadline. on time and are they on budget? Uh, I can't tell you on that score. I can find out for you in terms of the information that's available to us. Right. And, and my third, uh, very short question. Um, Ms Evans, you've made quite uh, uh, quite a few of your comments has been about the shortage of IT specialists and uh, skills management, skills shortages, etc. So given that an IT specialist, the, the first exam that they would do would be a national four and five. So how many uh, additional... Uh, pupils sat national four and five in IT in May June this year, in order to address your skills shortage. That's one source of our skills shortage. Well, that's the start of uh, learning IT. Yes, and I don't have that information with me at the moment, but I can make sure that it gets to you. Well, you don't need it to get to me because I can tell you. Okay. I mean, anyone going on to do uh, an HNC, an HND, a degree, a postgrad. Anyone looking at cybercrime or ICT at any one of Scottish, Scotland's universities or colleges, it's fair to say they would start with a national four and five. There were 29,000 fewer pupils this year sat national four and five. So if you're in charge of skill shortages and you're the most senior official in Scotland and you're looking at the shortage of IT specialists and telling us that they're taking cuts in pay to come and work for the Scottish Government, I would expect you to have an eye, at least, on our schools, our further education colleges and our universities to make sure that we are growing people for the security of jobs in the future. Well, I can tell you 29,000 fewer uh, uh, people did that. My next question, convener, is what was the original estimated cost of the Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme? Um, I would need to uh, consult with colleagues on that. The cost at the moment is £178 million, which is about 4% of the £4 billion funding which will be distributed as a result of the, of the CAP. Well, I know that it's forecast to be £178 million, but I'm finding difficulty about what was the original forecast, because capital spending in 2014-15 was £50 million, £32 million more than budgeted. So for last year, it was budgeted for £28 million, and it came in at £50. So it's gone from £28 but I don't know, is that just in one year? This, I mean, would some, someone round the table have the original estimate? I mean, having read the contract, it took the, the convener did ask you seven times if it was appropriate to read through a contract. I'm now talking about £178 million pounds contract. Correct. More than twice NHS 24. That's into insignificance now compared with this one. But if that contract had been read, surely you would have known what the original estimate was. As you'll be aware, there are contracts being let all the time within the Scottish Government and the accountable officer for each of those contracts will be responsible for ensuring that those contracts are correct at the time of signature taking into account some of the points that was raised in the earlier questioning about how items, circumstances, regulations and, and other contextual as, uh, aspects can change. The point I would make is that we know that the changes that took place in the way that the uh, Common Agricultural Payments Project has moved, including some of those which were beyond our control, but not entirely, means that this is not just an IT project, and an IT project which we know has cost much more than was intended, but also a, a huge change to the way that we administer payments for an important sector of Scotland's uh, community. 
Now, I'm not trying to pretend that moving from a very early stage of estimate of the kind that you're you've described to where we are now, the 178, is a success story. It is not. And I think you and other committees in the Parliament have had a lot of information and some representations from the accountable officer and the senior responsible officer for that project. And I don't think in any case they have described that as being uh, the way that we would have anticipated it turn it's has turned out. Um, what we are doing now is focusing on making sure that the project is, um, is effective, that we distribute the funding to farming communities within the timescale that has been stipulated by the EU. That is from the 1st of December to uh, June in 2016. We're due to start making payments shortly and we have a plan for how those will be um, executed over the next few months. Uh, we have learnt from this project. It's big, it's complex, and we had a lot of very late information, as I described earlier on, from a range of sources, including the way the industry wanted to change the, uh, the, the regions and the way the EU regulations added scope and complexity to the system. They also delayed it because we had to undergo, quite rightly, farm inspections to ensure that the checks and balances were in place before we triggered payments. So there is a whole range of not just IT-related complexities around this project which have added to the difficulty. I am not trying to pretend that it has been perfect or that it's an ideal example of managing that project, but we are focused now, as I think Graham Dixon explained to the committee and, uh, and other parliamentary forum, on getting it right for the farming community. Well, I think it's far from perfect, and it's not just any old IT account that you're learning from. I've been on this committee for five years nearly, and the previous Auditor General raised issues about the registers of Scotland and Crown Office Prosecution Service, etc. You know, and we were told then that the government was setting up a support system and it, you know, you know, everything was going to be all right. I mean the the point is, Ms. Evans, that in the Auditor General's 2014-15 audit of the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts, she doesn't list a whole load of IT systems. She only lists one. Only one. And I would have thought, as the most senior official of the Government in Scotland, I'm looking at a cost of £178 million. I know it's £32 million over budget for last year. I am absolutely amazed that you didn't do a wee bit of homework and come along to the Public Audit Committee, cross-party, of the Scottish Parliament to say, this was the original cost, we had various changes and whoever's fault that was. We're old enough, wise enough and ugly enough to accept that. We don't even know what the original cost was. So, <laughs> and can I just say, <laughs> I'm not really satisfied with your answers because we had the same answers five years ago before you even came into post. And I put on the record the Auditor General's comments, the programme has carried a significant level of risk from the outset. And risks will remain until full implementation and beyond. So, you're what... I, I would absolutely agree with that. It is a, it is a risk... Um, because the project is so complex, because it has got so many aspects to it, because it has had delays, it has had changes. We were talking earlier on about specification and how difficult it is to ensure that the specification of a contract is uh, flexible and pliable enough to be able to respond to changes very late on in the nature of, of, of the purpose it's intended for. This is a really well, good example yeah, of question. that. Um, so, I'm, again, I'm not here trying to make excuses. I think everybody has said that has been before you that, and indeed the Auditor General agrees, this is a high-risk project. And our focus now is to ensure that the payment plan that we have to ensure that farmers receive payments between the 1st of December and June, uh, and as the Cabinet Secretary was describing, I think, uh, earlier on in the week, that that is, is our entire focus at the moment, that and working with the community and ensuring that we're giving them the best support and information that we can. Well, I would like, Convener, if I may, to ask for uh, the, uh, the information, the written information that you've been unable to provide to us today. I think as the Audit Committee of this Parliament, we'd be failing in our duty if we weren't to look at the original forecasts and the... Uh, all of the reasons that have led to the increased spend here. So my final question is, uh, well, 
I, th I, th I think I'll change my final question. Where does all the extra millions come from? We're always told there's not enough money for this, not enough money for that. 178 million. I don't know how much over budget. I think it's 78% or 80%. Where does all the extra millions come from? When we're so short of money in Scotland and people in the Highlands can't get home care, you know, where do you get all the extra millions for your IT projects? Uh, my colleagues, uh, Alison and perhaps Aileen, will want to talk about the overall management of the budget. But I can say, as Principal Accountable Officer, that we are responsible for ensuring that where there is an overspend within the budgets, we have to make that up within the overall budget of the Scottish Government. But there's an there aren't additional extra millions. That, that's As an economist, there's an opportunity cost. You can't spend money Indeed. twice. So if we're you spend it there, it has to come from somewhere else. Absolutely Where right. does it come from? So we're making tough decisions all the time during the accounting year and across accounting years as well. One of the reasons why we ensure that uh, the money that we, uh, that we manage is underneath the cap of what we're allowed to carry forward so we don't lose a penny in terms of what is dedicated and spent on services. But you will know yourself that that if the money is finite, which it is, we have to make hard decisions across portfolios, yeah. not just within them, so where's about it coming? Where, or where we spend our money and how we make up for uh, difficulties in one area and pressures in another. Well, and that is often where we will end up making a decision to delay or to, to, um, to uh, increase funding in one area, knowing that we will have to reduce spending in another, yeah. either within the year or within subsequent years. And well, that's can I just say, just this is a final very question. A very brief answer, please. When, John, when any of us in the opposition parties, and, and we, we all do it, we want to spend more on X. John Swinney and every finance secretary before him, quite rightly, says to us, well, where are you taking that money from? Now, you've got far more insight into the budget. You know what you're spending. There are hundreds of millions of uh -huh. pounds above the forecast expenditure here today. And you can't tell me where it's coming from. What I am saying is that this is my responsibility and indeed the governance and assurance framework that operates within the Scottish Government, which is extensive and transparent, to ensure that we're taking decisions uh, and appropriate decisions, often with ministerial involvement, about where we change directions of financial spend. And if it was a difference between not making cap work and making cap work, that will be a very strong argument for us to move money to ensure that CAP operates and that farmers receive the payments to which they are due between December and June of next year. Okay, very brief, one minute supplementary from Colin Beattie and Nigel Doyle. Thank you, Vera. Just a, a quick question for the panel, actually, in connection with ICT. Um, how many of the panel have actually directly been involved in negotiation of ICT contracts and how many have been actually directly involved in uh, scoping IT projects? Three. Three of us. Um, I have to say mine was quite a long time ago, and the ICT world has moved on since then, but I have been involved in, in procurement and specification. And that's, that's three that have been involved directly in the contract negotiation and in the scoping of the project? Mine was in the scoping and specification of the, of the contract in local government. Thank you very much, uh, convener. I'm wondering if I could move on to European structural funds, which the Auditor General mentions in her report. Um, I suppose I could be concerned that it would appear that all four funds have either been interrupted or suspended. But I think what really concerns me, although you might want to comment on, on, on that, what really concerns me is in paragraphs 55 and 56, the auditor highlighted a number of concerns, including the robustness of information being retained and the control weaknesses <laughs> identified. Now, I just hold the information I put on my tax return for six years. Why is it difficult to hold on to the information that's required on European structural funds for the period for it to be audited? <coughs> Well, that is one of the conversations that we're having with a number of organisations, 18 that have had most errors cited in terms of the kinds of information that they have retained. 
uh, in response to receiving these funds. Uh, they vary. Um, sometimes it's actually not so much about the retention of information, but it's the nature of information. So, for example, um, one of the most common errors which we are finding uh, and which are being revealed through the audit process, which is pretty stringent, is the issue to do with um, timesheets. Some organisations have members of staff who work part-time on an ESF project, but the rest of their time on core or some other kind of project. That information, the regulation state and the audit practice states, needs to be really carefully, very carefully and, and pretty minutely detailed. Um, now, sometimes that is done. Sometimes it's done and not found at the time of the audit. Sometimes it hasn't been done. So there is a correlation with keeping information, keeping accurate information, but it's actually keeping the information that is required as part of the, uh, the regulations of, and criteria for receiving the funding. And if I might, that's one of the reasons and some of this uh, work that we've been doing very closely, and I've, I've met with two of the chief executives of the organisations or spoken to them recently about this myself. We're using the information from these past cases to inform how the next tranche of funding is applied. So we're doing away with that opportunity to, or the requirement to look at pieces of paper around um, uh, staff time and timesheets, simplifying the process considerably, putting a lot more effort and uh, um, uh, testing of the capacity um, of the organisations who are going to be in receipt of the next tranche of funding. So we have learnt a lot from the current, but we are still working with the organisations who have been in receipt of funding to drive down the error rate and to find those pieces of paper. Uh, so misuse is unlikely, but mis, uh, mislaid is, seems to be more of the issue. Yes, okay, and, and I take your point, it's more likely that people haven't got the information to back up that they've done the right thing than that they've actually, on wholesale anyway, misappropriated funds. But am I allowed to sit here and be surprised that how on earth long have we had the European Union? How long have we had structural funds? How long have we had bits of paper called timesheets? I mean, why isn't this absolutely basic to those who receive funding that they understand that this information needs to be there? Well, we've certainly made it crystal clear. In fact, um, over the past few months, earlier on in the year, the former Permanent Secretary and the Deputy First Minister wrote to all of those 18 organisations which had the highest level of errors of the kind that you are specifying to say to them, why, why is this happening and what are you doing to address it? And to be fair, some of them have made real progress with some of, uh, of their efforts to find those pieces of paper and identify where that information was recorded. I'm thinking particularly of Scottish Enterprise, who set up a task force very rapidly and who have driven down the number of errors that have been cited because they've managed to um, identify the kind of data and information that was being sought. But that is why simplifying the process and ensuring that there is a rigorous upfront testing of the capacity and an understanding within the organisations of what is actually required to comply with what are significant amounts of public funding and for which they will be held to account quite rightly. Do, do you really believe that message is getting through? I mean, sir, I, I can sit where you are and, and, and say what you've just said, and, 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 and I also understand your frustration that some of the organisations around you don't do some of the things you just asked them to do. But isn't this absolutely basic you won't get paid unless you comply with the rules on identifying where it's come from i mean every accountant in a sense has known that forever if i can't produce my timesheet i can't sorry i filled in timesheets once what, why is why is this difficult um i have talked to as i said a couple of the people who who have uh, been responsible for organizations or who are part of the process of, of giving money to the organizations um one of them i think was um as mystified as you are as to why the money that had been received by the organisation had not been seen as having strings attached to it in terms of the governance and assurance that was required with that. The others um, that I have heard about and, have, and one or two, as I said, I've spoken to, it is more the case of making sure that they keep tracks on administratively on the information in a rigorous and effective manner. And I think that uh, which is quite fundamental, but that is, and quite simple, that has been where they have found difficulties and that has been I would say in the, in the example of the Scottish Enterprise for example relatively quick and easy to put some of that right so there is information there it wasn't produced at the time that the audit happened where is it now it's here but yes it is and it's our role I think uh, 
and my role to ensure that we're making it very clear to those who are in receipt of this funding and continue to do so the kinds of measures that are required to ensure that this funding is accountable and that there is a track on the public pound. Um, grant aid funding generally and criteria is very important in this respect and where it comes to EU it is very finite and very specific. I so suppose we will, it's a, we will I suppose keep it's making a, that message. Yeah. I will keep saying that message and so will others who are responsible I, for I guess projects. it's only when you stop paying people that they realise that they have to do things right. I suspect that's not always an option that you have. Well, indeed, there, are, there is money being uh, clawed back and withheld on some of the projects. Um, and that has a, uh, an immediate effect, of course, of, mm. of uh, bringing to people's attention the importance of this. Um, but the danger is that there's some of the very, very good projects that are in some very important parts of the country in terms mm -hmm. of doing really important work. And what we don't want to do is disrupt the end, the, sorry, the, uh, end receiver and yeah. all of that and the, the people who are enjoying and making good use of the services and opportunities that are being provided through the ESF. Okay. Richard Simpson. Yes. The, um, the, uh, <laughs> are we moving? Can we move on to ONS? Yes, on ONS. Um, uh, on, the, on the ONS issue uh, of uh, ESA 10, um, I understand that that's now been, uh, that the system proposed by the Scottish Government to maintain the new contracts, uh, the NDP contracts under the private sector um, has been now approved by ONS and that is satisfactory. We're going to be able to move ahead with projects. What? Sorry, why so some? so the, dep the Deputy First Minister announced, I think quite recently at the end of November, the projects, the hub projects, yes. which had been given an ONS status, and they are live now. That's my understanding. Right. The, the proposal by the government to uh, have 60% private funding, 20% charitable funding, and 20% public funding is, I gather, the new mechanism by which these projects will be kept in the private sector. First of all, is that correct? So, um, if I could come in on this one, this is around the governance arrangements for the oversight and delivery of those projects. And so the balance is such that there is um, the interjection of the charity arrangement that actually enables this to still be seen as not government, um, and therefore the additionality that these projects bring can still continue, so yes. <coughs> So that, yeah, I understand. It's a mechanism, I mean, it was previously 60-40, and that was regarded as being satisfactory in terms of being not a public project. But the, the, I'm concerned about the charity, and I'd like to hear in terms of, of, of our discussion today, you know, what is that charity? Where is the money coming from? Who is going to be running it? How is it going to be independent? Is it going to be entirely run by the private sector? And, you know, just a little bit more information about that charity. Um, some of the detail around that actually will be best provided by the Scottish Futures Trust. But the charity itself will, will by its very nature, um, be separate from government. Um, that is the whole reason why there, there is a charity there that will actually enable that. But it is being set up, obviously, with terms that are worked through with the charity regulator, and obviously in specifying the, the nature of that charity then that will be the, the key point where that is securing what's need to be seen as delivering then the hub projects. But this is, this is an area where um, I could probably save the committee quite a lot of time and actually just send a, an actual report through of the very nature of the charity. Well, Kavina, rather than spending more time on it just now, I'm just still concerned you know, that we're still putting public money into this charity. This charity is now going to be wholly independent. Uh, who's going to appoint them? You know, there are lots of detail in there. Yeah. that I'd really like to see going forward because we're still, re we're still retaining a PFI, PPP, NDP. I mean, they're all the same, but slightly different. But it's all a public-private partnership, and it's getting the mechanism for that correct in the new, rather more complex rules that will now be established to satisfy ONS that I'm interested in. That's right. And just on, on the specifics of the hub model, which is the one that, we're, that I'm talking to you about in terms of the, the new... Um, the restart of the investment programme, which we've been very keen to see. Um, the important thing is to understand that there are a number of different safeguards and arrangements that are around this. So I've been talking to you about the governance arrangements, which is that 
division of different players that are involved, including the charity now. But there is still always a contract. And so that contract also gives the safeguards. So there's almost a double way of doing this. It's through the, through the people that are involved in oversight, but it's also through the contract arrangements. And so if it's helpful for you to see actually both both parts to this so you can get the assurance that you need, then I think that will give you a more complete picture on it. Thank you. Very Thank you. Brief supplementary from Finley from Colm Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Just a couple of quick questions on the ONS. Firstly, uh, given the new structure, are there any direct implications for the Scottish budget? And secondly, given the delays that have taken place while we've been waiting for the ONS to make its mind up, uh, the existing capital projects, are there any uh, cost implications for them? So, um, the, obviously the announcement was made on the 26th of November. Um, so SFT is engaging on a project by project basis with each of those that have now got the re-energised opportunity to proceed. Um, and that analysis will be prepared and will be for ministers to actually then work through what the implications of that are. Um, but you know, clearly everyone wants to just see these, these up and running as soon as possible. The other thing that's taken into account in the actual timing and delivery of these schemes, particularly when they are the schools, is how that actually fits with the educational year as well. So um, that information is being, is being worked up and uh, if that will be helpful for the committee to see, then again, we can send that through. But the new structure going forward, Will it have an ongoing cost? Is, is there any cost implication there at all? I realise that each of the individual projects may have to be re-evaluated and there could or could not be costs attached to that. I don't, you know, presumably that will come out shortly. Yes. So there's a distinction between the actual delivery cost of individual projects, which will be reassessed just by the fact that we're working on a slightly different time frame than before. But the model itself actually... Um, enables us to still have the additionality and therefore it will not count as part of our, our capital programme and therefore that isn't a hindrance to the investment programme overall, which is good to see. Okay. Okay, can I thank the Permanent Secretary and the team for their time this morning and I'm sure we can follow up in the correspondence uh, commitments that were given earlier. Thank you. Uh, can I move to agenda item number three, uh, which is consideration of responses from the Scottish Government and Westminster Public Accounts Committee on the Scottish Government's Major Capital Projects 2015 progress update. Uh, colleagues, you may be aware that the uh, Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee expects to shortly look at the issue of potential impact of ONS decision on major capital projects as part of its uh, draft budget scrutiny. Uh, welcome comments from colleagues. And what further action they would propose is taken. With the option to note the report, is that agreed? Okay. For us to know as an audit committee what the additional costs have been of this delay by the ONS, because it has been the ONS that's held us up for a considerable period of time, and it has meant that the Scottish budget, which is after all still at this point a limited budget, you know, it's been a cost imposed on us by Westminster, and I think you know we should be seeking some additional consequentials for the additional costs involved. Okay, so is it the decision of the committee that we should note the report? Yes, yes. Is that agreed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we move to agenda item number four, which is our section 23 report, uh, Scotland's Colleges 2015, uh, as well as the formal responses that we received from the Scottish Government, the Scottish Funding Council and Audit Scotland. We've also received correspondence from the University of Highlands and Islands and Glasgow Kelvin College, uh, which has previously been circulated to members and has been published on our website. Can I ask colleagues for comments? Oh, yeah, Mary yes, Dr Foxley is uh, a bit of a constant critic at this committee, including his uh, uh, when we, we were looking at NHS Highland as well. Um, I, I think that he has read uh, something that I did say. I reflected the figures accurately from the Audit Scotland report um, that 4% of students um, in the Highlands and Islands come from deprived areas. But unfortunately, Mr. F uh, Dr. Foxley only tends to read what uh, uh, the justification for his comments in the letter, because I think even Colin Beattie, who is my colleague on the Education Committee, will agree that I'm constantly raising the fact 
that the Scottish Index for Multiple Deprivation, it may work very efficiently in urban areas where you have areas of deprivation, but in highlands and islands, you can have the poorest child in the village sitting alongside uh, children of, of millionaires, etc. And that's the way of life in the highlands and islands. So I was pointing out that uh, people attending further education in the highlands and islands, the figure is much greater than 4%, but because there isn't a designated area because of the sparsity of population. Uh, and so, convener, I've never missed an opportunity to say that the Scottish Index for Multiple Deprivation may accurately reflect urban areas, but it does not accurately reflect poverty and deprivation in very remote communities. So, um, I don't think it's worthy of a reply, but I think it's unfortunate that he hasn't looked at the further work that I have been doing, even including raising it at stage two of the education bill yesterday, where we're looking at attainment. So that's that's all I have to say. <laughs> More comments? On BT? Probably we're at the point where we should uh, just note the responses we've got. There's a limited ability for us really to take this much further at this time. I think the qu overall question of the college is probably has to come back, but maybe that's something for a, for a legacy document. I don't know. Yeah. Richard Simpson? Yes. Just let me be clear. Are we dealing with the correspondence from Paul Johnson? It can, can deal with any items. I'm really interested in the... Just to clarify for record that so we've received the report and in response to the report, uh, this is some of the feedback that we've got from yeah. Ferry, so any correspondence... Thanks for that is. clarification, Convener. As you're a recent member of the committee, I want to no, just make sure I'm on the right spot. Um, I'm interested in the student support budget, which is at a record high of £105 million in Paul Johnson's letter to us in bursaries, childcare and discretionary funds. Um, I'm, I, do we get, has the committee received a breakdown of that as to which is actual maintenance payments and which is loans? Do we know? Do we know that? Because I'd be really interested to know. No. no. I, yeah. So I don't think we have that. But if that's the, if it's a wish of the request of the committee that we take that forward, then I'm sure we can. Uh, that that that, be, that would be good. And then the other thing is that in dealing with the a letter from the Scottish Funding Council, uh, I find that very. Uh, Confusing. First of all, with regard to the merger uh, savings, I, I really have no clearer than I was. Um, I have no idea what these are, what these are intended to be. Again, I may have missed it not being on the committee when this process started, but uh, you know, the 50-something million of annual savings that are supposed to come in from 2015-16, um, it seems to me that the letter from the Sartre's Funding Council if I read it correctly, and I may not be because I find it a very extraordinary letter, seems to confuse efficiency savings, which is something that every public institution has to undertake, uh, with the merger savings, which are different. I'm also very unclear as to what the regional, regional costs are, are involved, because if you take the area we've been looking at in detail of the merged uh, Motherwell, Cumbernauld, Coat Bridge College into the North Lanarkshire College. South Lanarkshire stayed out of that, so there's still a regional structure above it. And, you know, when they talk about, when we talk about 50 million savings, how much are the additional costs of these regional structures? So I'm just unclear about that as well. I can't see that in the letter. So that's something else I would like. So I'm, I, I think noting is, is, in that respect, is something that I think it needs to be a little bit more than noting, I think. I would say that, uh, you know, the committee, I would feel the committee would recommend the committee should say it's not yet satisfied that it's seen uh, precisely what's happening. And I suppose the EIS report recently, which reviewed staff in terms of the, uh, the, the expectations about the merger and the, and the positive things that would come out of it, seems to have been negated by the EIS survey. So, uh, you know, I'm really pretty unhappy about this process. And I have to say it's one we all agreed it was necessary to have improved efficiency and, you know, less overlap, etc. But I'm really unhappy about the information the audit committee is being provided with. Is your turn? I am just wondering whether we're going to be able to pursue very much realistically in the remaining time that we've got. But I do note the Auditor General says that she will be 
have providing an annual report on Scotland's colleges next year. In other words, it's the annual report. And it might well be that the best practical thing to do is to leave it to our successor committee to look at the next phase, which undoubtedly will go back to the same issues. Okay, can I just make a couple of points just before we conclude and how we take it forward? So I think, firstly, uh, it seems perfectly reasonable for the committee to seek further information from the government on what was a recognised decision in terms of the college mergers and the savings would come about as a result of that. I don't think we would have pursued the mergers if it wasn't for the fact that the proposed sum that we'd be saving would be 50 million. That was the, right. that was the amount that was highlighted and that's why there was, as, as I recall, uh, significant cross-party uh, agreement that we should proceed with that. Okay. But I would hope that when considering that and providing all the necessary information to the government for that informed decision to be taken, uh, that the, f the figures of 50 million were pretty robust. And I suppose the question we're asking here today, which we're quite right to ask, is are these figures as robust as they should be at this stage? Uh, so I think it would be helpful uh, for us to seek the information from the government, uh, from whatever agencies uh, can provide the information to be clear on how robust the figures are. Because I must admit, after reading the uh, response from the Scottish Funding Council, I'm no further convinced than there was when Tavi Scott raised the question uh, of the Scottish Funding Council and we took evidence on this. So I think it won't be unhelpful uh, for us to seek whatever information uh, that the government have at their disposal uh, or, S or the SFC that they can provide to us, because I would be astonished if they were pursuing this and hadn't been aware of some significant information that provides more detail than what's been provided here. You see, on another point that was raised, uh, just draw members' attention to the correspondence that we received from Alan Sherry, the principal of Kelvin College, in respect of the compulsory redundancies at Glasgow Kelvin College. I think it's important to recognise the, you know, the concerns that have been raised by Alan Sherry is that the uh, this term that was used of compulsory redundancies is one that isn't accurate, uh, and felt that it wasn't accurate for us to re to refer to this in the report. I must admit, I've reflected on this and I'm content that the, the actual wording of the report is actually correct and reflects in the fact that redundancies did take place at the college, albeit in the footnote of the document were provided uh, background to that in that a private contractor uh, who was the uh, catering, who was responsible for the catering contract was in place and it was the co contractor who carried out the compulsory redundancies. But has to have been recognised the background to that is, as I understand it, that the employees were too paid as part of the previous contract that had taken place at Stowe College. So I think I'm satisfied that compulsory dances have taken place and also satisfied that there was an exchange with the Education uh, Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, with a number of members around the table. And that exchange confirmed that she also opposed the compulsory redundancies that have been proposed at the college and asked for the government's policy to be implemented but recognised that it was not in the gift of the government to ensure that those uh, that, that policy was implemented. Uh, it was up to the college to take those decisions. Uh, so I must admit I'm satisfied that we've accurately reflected it in the report but I do understand that the, uh, the college may have their own uh, opinion on that and are quite entitled to that and we will note that and ensure that it's already provided for public record the response that we received from Alan Sherry. Okay, how we proceed in this, colleagues? If we can maybe get some feedback on that, Colin Beattie. Yeah, um, I've no problem about asking for more information. I'm conscious, a bit like Nigel, of the timing that we've got left, really, to, to look at these things. And I'm also looking at the SFC letter, uh, which says that uh, there'll be a post-merger evaluation for each individual member uh, in merger in autumn 2016 because um, it says here that the, uh, all, the sh all these uh, are scheduled up to July 2016, so clearly autumn is when we'll actually get the hard figures and when, you know, no matter what anybody says, we'll see actually what was achieved. Yeah, I, just two points. I don't think that should stop us asking about the 50 million annual savings which were promised because uh, you know, that, that was the reason that all of us supported it and voted for it. But there, there is a, a second issue um, that I do think we should keep on the agenda. It wasn't just 50 million pounds savings every year. We were actually promised that the quality of education and training would be enhanced. 
So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I know we're the audit committee, but I don't think we should lose sight of that because that was another reason why you know, we thought the larger colleges, larger expertise, economies of scale, more specialised, uh, that we did actually expect and I believe were promised uh, enhanced uh, quality of education and training. Sandra White. Obviously, it's just been a substitute and popping in and out, but obviously have looked at this as well. Um, legacy paper for the audit committee. Uh, my concerns lie with the Scottish Funding Council, uh, having read the letter and also looked at, uh, you know, the table of colleges and mergers and payouts, etc. Uh, I don't know if you can ask questions in regards to that, uh, you know, as a follow-up yeah. rather than closing it. But I do think. As an audit committee, perhaps you should be looking at the Scottish Funding Council in the next round. Okay, colleagues, so we have the option to note the report. I'm not really getting the feeling that that's the majority of the committee's view. Uh, the other option is to write for further information uh, from uh, the government. And I think there's been some feedback that the 50 million figure, which has been a theme that, yeah. that's occurred throughout the committee's evidence sessions on a number of occasions, has been a lack of clarity uh, around this figure, which we all want to achieve, but just want to see how that's going to be achieved. Uh, I think, you know, it will hold, and I think we just have to make it clear to the Scottish Funding Council that we are want to be more, want to see more clear and concise information uh, surrounding this, so that we can be satisfied that the direction of travel is one that, that is going to achieve those those savings. I think what would be uh, a poor reflection of the committee is that if we arrived in autumn and we didn't reach the figure and we hadn't in some way highlighted that this was an issue. Uh, so do members think that we should write on that basis? Right. Sorry, Nigel, Don. I, mean, I think you've got that absolutely right. It's direction of travel. I think what the SSC letter says that you won't know you've got to the station until you've got this year's accounts to add up, but it is direction of travel and they must have some work in progress numbers uh, and it would be good to see what they can provide us with. Well, so, uh, as we know, the accounts uh, and we've seen from evidence we've taken some of our colleges, including Coat Bridge, uh, sometimes they are not quite coming forward as, as quickly as it should be, and there's some information that's maybe not been as robust as it should be. So we have to be clear that even an interim position, which I'd be, would be surprised if the Scottish Funding Council wasn't at least carrying out some kind of assessment of how the uh, what the current position is in respect to the savings. I would be, I'd be surprised if, be, and I'd be surprised if the government weren't putting pressure on Scottish Funding Council to advise them on that because the government will want to ensure that the fifty million it saved is redistributed and, and done for the is, is brought forward for the benefit of the students as made because that the whole idea was is that we made the savings so that we could then reinvest uh, in the, the college estate and the other aspects of the student experience. So uh, it would be reasonable uh, for the government at least to have the same appetite as we do to be, clari to be able to clarify exactly where we are. Just to say they did merge in 2013, which is yeah. about going into 2016, so you know, we, we should have annual accounts. It shouldn't be that yeah. difficult to look at what savings uh, have been realised. Yeah. Okay. Is that helpful, colleagues? I think we should move on the basis of the written, uh, written, further written information. Okay, uh, thank you, colleagues. And as previously agreed, we now move to agenda item number five, which we've agreed to hold in private.